Um, welcome, everyone. It's great to see so many of you here. Um, you never know when you're doing a, a, a free ticket um, event. Um, you, you're expecting to lose some and gain some, but we've definitely, whatever we've lost, we've more than gained. So it's great that we've had to put out extra chairs. So thank you all for coming. My name is Bill Swainson. I'm a trustee of LitFest. And it's a great pleasure this evening to introduce this event, which is one of a number, and I hope a growing number, of partnership events with Lancaster Arts. And Jocelyn Cunningham, who's with me here, is going to introduce this project. Some of you might know something about it. Some of you may have even been listening to the, um, the performance that Orla gave in mid-October with uh, jet skis in attendance. So tonight, um, no jet skis, but um, I hope that you will enjoy this performance. Now, there's a couple of things I just need to say about LitFest. LitFest is a registered charity. We're only able to do the work we do by the fundraising we do and by the generosity of our supporters. So on the way in, we were quietly offering you a donations bucket. On the way out, we will be rattling it. Um, it is also possible to go online to LitFest, and if you go to the supporters page, you'll be able to donate there, and that will help us uh, continue to do the work that we've been doing. But um, I cannot tell you what a delight it is to see a full audience for a really interesting project, and I'm now going to hand over to Jocelyn to introduce what it was that she commissioned two years ago. Can you hear me? Yes? Okay. So I'm Jocelyn. Hello, everyone. Um, so as Bill said, uh, I'm director at Lancaster Arts, and we have a couple of people here from our team. Um, but you may or may not know of us. We're uh, based at Lancaster University, but we do work all over the place. And one of the things we do is work with all art for forms, particularly where those art forms can overlap. And I think one of the things that we really focus on is how people, artists and non-artists, can start to look at how art forms might overlap. So we've been working with LitFest for many years, um, but we do have an event in April, uh, April 20th, with Linton Quasi Johnson, who is publishing his memoirs, Time Come, a few days before. And true to that idea of mixing art forms, we're going to be showing film of the work that's uh, of, of various historic events that have really influenced the way that Linton Crazy Johnson has developed his work. And that's very much part of our partnership with uh, the Lancaster Literature Festival. So this work is also in the vein of how we mix art forms and what that means, so that it's not just, hey, let's do some dance in the gallery, but where the, that overlap really happens. And, and also that it's about ideas, that it starts with shared ideas, shared passions, shared commitment to those ideas. So two years ago, we had an annual theme of water and what we're finding is that although we do a whole year on a particular theme, it sometimes takes two years <laughs> to find the right partners that will really make that live. So there's a theatre company uh, based in Birmingham called Stan's Caff. And one of the things they do are international tours um, that, that go everywhere with a very localized kind of piece of work. And they've done some amazing stuff. But they were interested in rivers of the world. And the two artistic directors actually went to Lancaster University. So because they were interested in rivers and we had a theme of water, we thought it might be worth talking about. And they're looking at you know, the Thames, the Volga, the Mississippi, going all over the world. And we thought, hey, up, what about the loon? So that was probably about a year ago, I think, when we first started talking about what that would mean. And kind of like the best of our work, it happened organically. One partner led to another. So we started talking about the loon, and then we met the sewing cafe. And could the sewing cafe people please put up their hands and just wiggle them about? <laughs> hey! <laughs> I think after this performance, you may well wish to speak with them about how this evolved. But one of the very exciting things was that once the sewing cafe were 
on board. We then worked with the writer, Claire Dean, and then our actor, Orla Cottingham. And it wasn't, here's the sewing cafe creating their banner, and here's the actor who's going to read the words that Claire writes for the banner. It happened kind of all together in a very organic way, which meant that Claire Dean, the writer, ended up contributing to the banner. And the ideas went back and forth, so that what you're seeing is not a written piece, you're not seeing a banner, you're not seeing a performance, you're seeing something that really genuinely combines all of those things and starts with the heart of what the River Loon has been about for all of us. So I hope you enjoy it and um, let's maybe talk afterwards. Thank you. Bank folk of legs and wheels, welcome, welcome, welcome to you all. We're going on a journey and I need you to prepare yourselves. We've 53-ish miles of river to navigate under 43 of your bridges. Rivers shape the land we call home and rivers take the land we call home. To name something is to have power over it. So it is perhaps fitting that it is difficult to pin down the true name of this river. Loon, loin, lon, named for a god or the fullness of water. I'll tell you a secret. The true name of this river is the sound of a high beck running over moss-furred stone the colour of a December sky, the touch of an otter's whiskers. You won't be able to pronounce it, so we'll stick with Loon for now. <laughs> Bank folk, let us begin. At the end of our river, where the tide rushes up from the Loon Deep. Oh, forgive me, I forgot to mention. The river is best travelled in other forms, so you need to um, shed your coats now and grow some gills. We are all now salmon who have travelled the Atlantic Ocean to find our way home using only the stars above and our own inner compass. Feel your fins. They'll help you move through the water and swim. At six metres above sea level, the winking light of Plover Scar Lighthouse guides ships into the mouth of the loon. But us salmon don't need lights to call us home. The fell-soaked smell of our birth river is enough to guide us into the loon estuary. Swim, my salmon, swim. We're passing Sunderland Point now, where the land is sundered by the sea twice a day. All rivers carry the past, here, in Loon's estuary, time swirls with the tides, midi mixing and muddying the years. A tall ship, sun-baked and salt-scoured on its journey from the West Indies, strains at anchor as barrels of sugar are offloaded. And a young black boy is carried from the hold, his body racked with fever. He cries out for his mommy. The river here is a grey open sky, wing skimmed with oyster catchers. Skeins of knot dance in the wind, hungry after their journey south from a summer in the Arctic. And salmon, like us, who have travelled 1,500 miles from the Atlantic to get here, will be tied chased into the Vikings' half nets if we don't watch out. We'll head upstream faster now, past the faint masts and rigging of lost ships, and past the shiny new yachts of glass and dock, on past the smokehouse, unless you want to end up on somebody's plate. <laughs> now the sign here may say the Golden Ball, but most know this pub as Snatchums. And any of you who aren't um, salmon-seeming enough, you, sir, for example, 
may find yourself press-ganged onto an 18th century ship short of hands. Heads up above the waterline, we're approaching Lancaster and the strata of Castle Hill. If you look hard, you can see castle on top of fort, on top of fort, on top of fort, on top of fort. Each one a warning to incomers on the tide that this stretch of river is taken. Oh, there are beds floating on the river here. Ah. We're swimming past Marsh Point and through the flood of 1927. The river is roaring, but you can just hear the shouts from people trapped inside the sanatorium. The water has already taken three people who slept in isolation huts in the grounds. Help is coming! The tide is pushing us on. Now the Loon is what the Guild of Geographers call a braided river. It sweeps silt and shingle into islands that come and go with flood and force over time. Sometimes though, an island stays still long enough for people to build on it, or in the case of salt air, to fill it with rubbish. <laughs> We're swimming under the Carlisle Bridge now as trains rumble overhead and the waves push us on. Beneath us, a creature of bike wheels and empty beer cans rises through the tumble filth. It's dripping with plastic and slick with the green slime that comes from too much fertiliser on the fields. Swim quietly. You don't want to get trapped in its big trolley belly. <laughs> We're past. And would you look at that? A fearless cormorant has landed on the creature's head and is holding out its wings to dry in the late afternoon sun. <laughs> Ooh. There's a, a thick reek of warm linseed oil on the breeze. That's the smell of lino being made. You can hear the clogs on the cobbles as a throng of workers thunders out of loon mills, bang on finishing time, not a second before. They know their boss, Lord Ashton, sits in his big house across the river, watching them through his telescope. It's a good job we're swimming rather than sailing this stretch of river because somebody's only gone and strung a rope across the water. It's fastened from Quay to Skirton side in 1861 and there are folks in boats holding the rope steady. Crowds are gathered on both banks and there are oohs and ahs as the great British Blondin tries his chances on a tightrope across the loon. Ooh. Ooh. And I'm sorry, but the, uh, the tide's pushing us on, so we don't get to see if he makes it or not. Was that a splash? The crowd's gasps have faded into the blattering of sailcloth in the breeze. Cotton bales and rum barrels are being unloaded and winched up into warehouses. On the quayside are stacks of imported mahogany bound for gillows, makers of fine furniture established in 1730. If you read the reflections, they tell a different story. Instead of exotic wood being piled before the grand pillars of the customs house, you'll see black people's bodies piled high on cold stone. That's a reflection that will outlast every tide. The pinkish glow of a Morecambe Bay sunset is reflected in a hundred golden windows stretching right up the hill to the Ashton Memorial. Now, Ashton's Folly might look like expensive stone, but don't be fooled. It's built using the fly ash from his mills that we passed earlier. And here's the Millennium Bridge. So new it has barely scratched the air at its sides, but it's already gathering padlocks and stories. People are gathering here 
the night after the flood in December 2015. Do you remember? There are no street lights, no traffic lights, no house lights, no phones. 55,000 people without power for three days. Friendly offers of help and food are being exchanged in the growing dark. A Roman decurion looks down into the waters and asks the god Eolonus for help, vowing to erect a carved stone in return. Someone let him know they're giving out hot food at the Gillo. An uncrossable old bridge stood here for almost half a century. The first arch was pulled down to let ships through in 1802, and the final one fell down in 1845. The Guild of Silt and Sand keeps the accounts for this stretch of river, and any dredging of silt is always repaid in sand. Over time, it became impossible to get ships out of their yard and down to the sea. Damside Street, Water Street. Old courses the river once took are remembered in street names around here. The dark rush of an understreet river can be heard bubbling beneath the grates when the many-engined growl of the one-way system slows and stills. Here lies the mill race, a mill's tail rushing from a long-gone water wheel under the cellars of shops and flats to rejoin the river, sometimes bursting out too soon. The Guild of Storms marks its ledger of floods on walls and in the hearts of those that live and work on the banks between rivers. The last Greyhound Bridge before this one was dismantled, its metal bones taken upriver to build a bridge at Halton. I'll point it out when we get upstream. Here, when the tide is close to turning, you can feel how the warp of fresh water is woven through with a weft of salt. So you're swimming both hill river and small sea. Green air, another island that stayed still long enough to be built on. Oh, and here's Benice Dent in a Citroen Saxo bobbing downstream with the swans. <laughs> it's 2005 and she's just driven off Skirton Bridge. But don't worry, she'll be rescued in time. <laughs> now, the water bailiff, protector of salmon, lived in a house on Main Street, marked by the fish carved in stone above the door. He and the house are long gone, so there's no one watching over us as we swim into danger. Before the weir, three islands have become one that rises and falls with the rain. This island belongs to the heron, and they watch over the fish ladder that we have to climb to get to the next stretch of river. You must jump into the sky to swim further. Watch out for the heron. Jump! Jump! <sighs> We've just passed the electricity substation that flooded during Storm Desmond. They've raised it on stilts so the river can't reach it again. <laughs> for now, at least. Here, water's taken from the river for all of Lancaster and Morecambe to use. Threads of the river wind from here through pipe after pipe after pipe. And then you turn on your tap and invite the river into your home. Well, all right, I admit it. It does go through Lancaster Treatment Works first. But it's more hygienic, but less poetic. Now, here's a riddle for you. When does a fish swim above a river? When it's in a canal. And when is a canal above a river? when it's an aqueduct. Ours was built in the 1790s and sealed tight with clay. Over the years, water began to seep out. Well, you can't blame it. All water wants to find its way back into a river. Rivers of tarmac rush overhead. The M6. The longest motorway in England at 230 miles will cross the Loon another four times after this. 
let's race it north. You'll have to swim faster. Just up the hill from here in Holton, in a churchyard, Sigurd, the dragon slayer story, is told on a Viking stone cross. On the banks, you can hear the hammering of hot iron at long gone forges. Perhaps the dragon slayer's sword is being prepared right here in Holton for him to face the dragon. Watch out for the sparks as they hit the icy water and sizzle into darkness. Around here is the new hydroelectric dam. See how it's lighting up the windows in the darkness one by one. There are no dragons lurking in the shadows here. But on the bank beside Holton Mills, a line of elephants is silhouetted in the moonlight. The mechanical elephants of Loonside Engineering are lined up waiting for repair after a long seaside summer carrying children with sticky fingers along the sands. To either side of the middle mill, water wheels turn in different centuries for corn mills, cotton mills and makers of coconut matting. What was that? Did you hear that splash? You see, mill pools are dangerous places for salmon, what with the herons and fishing lines. It's a good job there are no humans on this journey. Because they'd have to watch out for Jenny Greenteeth. Have you met her before? You wouldn't forget her. Oh, you've met her. You wouldn't forget her, would you? Oh, hair tangled with weeds, skin as grey as stone, teeth furred with moss. Snails cling to the underside of her arms as she reaches out of the water to grab you. Ooh. This isn't a spot to linger, human or salmon. Let's jump this next weir and swim hard. As we approach the bend in the river here, let's slip free of our salmon scales and don the furry suit of an otter instead. That's some two layers of fur you'll need, warm, cosy inner and waterproof outer. Oh, and don't forget the webbed feet. Turner famously painted the spectacular view from the Crookaloon. But we can't see the view in the dark, even with otter eyes high on our head above the waterline. You can feel the crook-like bend of the river with your whiskers, though. We're passing under three bridges now. This one is the old Greyhound Bridge that I told you about. And now we need to scramble up another weir. The night is frost bright. Above us, a white metal bridge shines. This one carries drinking water from Thirlmere all the way to Manchester. If you listen hard, you might hear the water ring with the bells of Armbeth and Withburn, two villages that were drowned to make Thirlmere Reservoir. The Artlebeck Milestone tells us it's four Roman miles to Lancaster, but we don't want to go back the way we came. To the east, the sun is rising over the wind whirlers on Caton Moor, and we otters must keep swimming north. At Clafton Brickworks, the morning work's begun. Gravity is already bringing buckets of clay down the hillside. On the other side of the river is the village of Afton, where a famous pudding is made every 21 years. It was last made in 2013 in a metal bathtub. In 1992, a tremendous 3.82 tonnes of pudding were all stirred up in a cement mixer. Sounds tasty. Now, if someone could just swim back in time a little and grab a piece for the journey, it'd be much appreciated. The River Wenning meets the loon here carrying water from Fell Beck that fell 110 metres into the darkness of Great Gaping Gill before rushing on. The water here is rain-swift and dishwater brown, and the sun is climbing higher. See, us otters need to sleep in the day, so um, let 
let's shake off the fur and swap it for the fine black feathers of a dipper. The loin bridge would be a good spot for a dipper to make a nest. Spring is coming. Tendrils of water crowfoot are growing up towards the light, but we've a river to keep exploring. A dipper can walk underwater as well as soar through the air. So let's scrabble over the river bread and, 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 and gobble up some mayfly nymphs as we go. At Arcombe, a corpse river crosses the road to Melling. If it was summer, the river could be forded by the coffin bearers, but it's spring and the water is thunder fast and belly high. The family on the bank will have to find enough money to pay the ferryman to carry their father to the other side. Shake the water from your wings and let's fly a while. Over Melling Viaduct, 22 arches stretching not only over the river as it is, but across many of the river's old paths too. Over the Overborough Roman Fort, which lies beneath and within the walls of Borough Hall, and over the Horswater Aqueduct, which carries water from over the rooftops of yet more drowned villages. Now, let's dip into the river before we reach the devil. Oh yes, the devil is in the river building a bridge. It's rare to see him working so hard, but here he is, in Kirby Lonsdale, placing stone on top of stone on top of stone. There's a woman desperate to reach her cows on the other side and bring them home, but the water's too high. So she's made a deal with him. He can have the first soul that crosses the new bridge. She's not daft. She has a plan. She's going to throw a bun across the bridge and get her dog to chase it. It'll be a shame to lose them up, but it never stops barking. <laughs> Look at those magnificent arches rising from the waves. The devil works hard when he's a soul to take. The woman reaches into her pinny for the bun. But it's not there. Eaten by one of her children, perhaps. <gasps> Has anyone here got anything to eat? Did anyone get any of that pudding from Afton? You did. Oh, chuck it to her, would you? <laughs> Phew! Spring is passing, and dippers need to get on with making nests. So let's fling off our feathers and swim a while as dragonfly nymphs instead. Ruskin's view, you know, it's one of the loveliest views in England, therefore the world, and it can be seen from the bank high above. But who needs to see that? when you can navigate the submerged mountains and valleys of wave and riverbed on six tiny legs. 320 million years ago, this was a tropical sea near the equator. Watch out for the feathery arms of huge sea lilies. Ooh, was that a shark? Now, did I mention that as a dragonfly nymph, your gills are in your rear end? Breathing in and out through your bottom will help you push your way through the water. Quick, swim faster. Under Underly Bridge we go. Summer is gathering with the meadow sweet on the banks. It's time to transform into an adult dragonfly. Let your skin split, clamber out and spread your wings. Now you can fly again. Below, huge rocks are sheltered in the sheepfold instead of sheep. It's an artwork by Andy Goldsworthy. And why not shelter the boulders? They've moved through this valley for far longer than the sheep. How long? Um, well, we could ask the Guild of Stone, the oldest guild we'll encounter on our journey, but it takes an age for them to tell even a word of a story, so... Uh, We'd best fly on. Keep close to the course of the river here. Oh, perhaps not too close. 
We're at Sedba now. In 2020, sewage streamed into the river here for 353 days. The longest discharge in the country. Well, I know it's not the greatest claim to fame, but a record's a record. <laughs> you need to speed up, sir. Dragonflies don't live as long once they've got wings. We've 56 days at best. Sun is high and the, the air thrums with heat. Let's skim the surface. Skyfresh becks bring the cool damp of sphagnum moss and cotton grass and bilberry leaves down to join the bubble and churn of the loom. Let's fly under Rigmaiden Bridge and on past the next Roman milestone that tells us there's 53,000 paces to go. Oh, don't worry. That's to Carlisle, we're not going that far. Tip a wing to water's meeting, where the river Rothy meets the loon, bringing water from Courtly Spout, England's highest waterfall. We're passing under Killington New Bridge, which is actually quite old. Lincoln's Inn Bridge, where there's no inn. <laughs> and the 11 arches of the highest bridge over the loon, the Waterside Viaduct. This is the Crook of, Lo Crook of Loon Bridge. No, 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 I've not made a mistake, thank you very much. This is the Crook of Loon. That was the Crook of Loon. There's a world of difference. <laughs> Please keep up. <laughs> Cemetery gods of the underworld. Alia Seneca lived for 35 years. Aurelius Verulus erected this stone for his loving wife. Ah, oh. translated that from the Latin for you. Your wings look a little crumpled and the journey just gets tougher from here. You should all climb into the hard shells of white clawed crayfish. Have you ever been a crayfish before? No? Okay. Well, the key thing to remember is you walk forwards and you swim backwards. Daylight's fading. The how gills rise to our right, great coombe to our left. These hills are shaped by the memory of ice that left them 10,000 years ago. This is the Loon Gorge. The Lancaster to Carlisle Railway runs above us. The entire 69 mile line was built in only two years. You can hear the shouts and hammering of 10,000 navvies, English, Irish, Scots, all drubbing away at the Ordovician rock formed from beds of sand 400 million years before. In camps, the navvies share a beer and a campfire with the M6 workers from just over a century later. Have you seen the wood here that's shaped like a heart? The trees were planted for the lives of navvies lost. Or they were planted by a farmer to demonstrate his love for his wife. Or they were planted as a memorial to Westmoreland's own Romeo and Juliet, who came from warring farms. You see, there are as many stories of the heart-shaped wood as there are trees growing in it. Oh, the path up river is getting steeper. Sheep are hefted to these hills. Each generation teaches the scramble steep pathways to the next. Farmers used to count them in Cumbric. Yam, Tam, Tedera, Medera, Pimp. Setera, Lettera, Hovera, Dovera, Dick. Yam, Tam, Tedera, Medera, Pimp. Setera, Lettera, Hovera, Dovera, Dick. The sheep aren't the only four-legged roamers of the high hilltops. There are native ponies up there too, wind-hardened and sharp-hooved. Their manes are tangled with bracken and mud. They're brave enough to tackle heavy snows and take on the shap shook, a great black beast of a dog that prowls these parts. In fact, Farmers at one time used to use bands of ponies to protect their sheep from wolves. 
As we pass under Loon's Bridge, the nickering of ponies and bleating of sheep can still be heard, but wolf howls and cumbric counting have vanished from the warm summer night. Now the M6 is weaving back and forth on bridges overhead. This was the highest section of motorway in the country for 58 days in 1970. <laughs> then they opened the M62. Let's follow the curve round the malt of Castle Howe. The river snatches a little more time from the ancient monument every day. And now we turn to the east. No stopping at tea based services, sorry. <laughs> No lovely coffee and cakes for us today. Not that it would be easy to hold them with our crayfish claws. Here, by the Tea Bay Bridge, lives the Tea Bay witch, Mary Baines. She's foreseen fiery, horseless carriages coming over Shap Fell, and she has a habit of cursing all who cross her. To escape punishment, she transforms into a hare. Well, you lot know all about transformations by now. But we won't become hares today. You need wings for this last stretch. Climb out of your crayfish shells and put on the feather coats and sharp beaks of a hen harrier. It's time to sky dance through the mizzle just to watch out for the gamekeepers with their guns. Autumn's returned. The leaves on the bankside tree by Rain Bridge are turning to gold. And the salmon, who made it so far, are scraping out nests in the gravel with their tails. Stretch those wings and soar on the updrafts. Far below us, the guild of peat and scree offers fresh waters from the Becks of Ray, Ellagill, Churngill, Langdale, Udale, Coat. We have travelled through the seasons, up a river that has run through counties as well as countries. It once flowed through the kingdom of Strathclyde. It is a Lancashire river that takes water from Yorkshire, a Westmoreland river that has become Cumbrian over time. And we are nearing its beginning, which is our end. So, where is our river's source? Some say it's St Helen's Well, others not, and that you have to hike up here to find it. But what does a source actually look like? Like this, or this? And how can you be sure? There's another river loon further east that flows into the Tees. Names cannot be trusted, and neither can the shape that someone takes. Speaking of which, you can all return to the ground now and into your human shapes. And don't mind me, I need to slip back into the coat of the river itself. Hard work wearing all this skin and standing on two legs. But don't look so surprised. You just swam and paddled and flew all the way up the River Loon. It's good for a river to know all of her length and to meet those that live on the banks in between the world of rivers too. So now, close your eyes, count to ten, and I'll be gone. Close your eyes. Anyone who would like to ask a question of Jocelyn and Lancaster Arts or Ola the performer if she's up for answering a question or to ask a question about the sewing cafe. Jocelyn, you, asked, you talked earlier about the theme of water. How do you come to your themes and what are you looking, looking forward to next? It's, uh, it's not a scientific process. <laughs> um, I think... I think the team, I mean, Alice is our producer here, our creative producer who, who really pulled all of this together. And I think that 
it's really interesting to think of a theme that is broad enough that could bring in many different ideas. It's not just, this is what we mean by water. So, you know, we're based at a university, and a university that happens to excel particularly in thinking about, uh, you know, the global challenges of water, flooding, climate change, um, water pollution, and of course, after the floods here in Lancaster, um, the university's been very involved working with the city council quite closely on, on how to, you know, ameliorate the next time. Um, I'm working uh, with the city council quite closely on the mill race that's uh, part of uh, Lancaster. But I think, I mean, just to answer your question, I think it's, uh, it's a question of listening and talking, partly to find out where artists want to take it. But you know what? The honest truth is that it's quite, quite serendipitous. Um, this year we're in the year of ritual, and uh, I think perhaps it's had a lot of resonance for Miranda, who's our curator, and I, be because after coming out of COVID, it's felt like we missed a lot of rituals. Maybe it's time for us to reinvent rituals. So you can see we're not just going, oh, we're going to talk about this. It's exploring it from many different kinds of angles. Next year we're thinking maybe flight would be a good one. So you could be bringing in with flight uh, you, know, you, you know, the situation that we've got with people seeking sanctuary. So there's so many different dimensions to all of that. So if any of you have some ideas about what a good theme would be, this is what I mean by listening. Please speak with Miranda or Alice or I, and please um, we really welcome your ideas because it's not as if I'm soaking in the bathtub and suddenly go Eureka. It comes out of many conversations. I think it might be great if someone from the Sewing Cafe perhaps talked about how this was created. Who would like to uh, go for that? <laughs> <laughs> Hello, everybody. Um, right. Well, the, the process for us the process for us was was really straightforward because, as Jocelyn has explained, it, it was um, a, a project that involved all of the different areas, and, and working with Claire was an absolute joy because Claire's a, a very um, likes to get engaged in historic research, and she had. Um, done a huge amount of looking at the river, looking at the whole area, and she resulted in um, having this massive list of every feature um, on the river, around the river, above the river. So that kind of then was just a massive tick list that we could work through. I mean, I wouldn't like to say we've got absolutely every element that she, she mentioned but it was just a case of uh, there we, we had our list. I mean, actually getting the shape of the river, uh, now that did involve a bit of artistic license because <laughs> um, 53 miles and trying to get it onto a, a rectangle. So. Um, <laughs> I, I wouldn't actually like any of you to get uh, get a map out or get Google Earth out and, and actually go, well, actually, you've got that bend wrong because, yes, we have. <laughs> so um, it was just a case of sort of playing around with that. We had, we were, we had about five different shapes of how the loon could fit and, and we actually just ended up picking the one we liked best. But every little kink is in there. It's just we might have bent it the other way just to fit it on. Um, so I think from there, it was kind of people really just picking the techniques that they like to work on. Um, so it was just a case of people could also, we had about five days where we worked on it together but we also um, did a lot of work at home. So that's why a lot of it is actually um, stitched onto the, the background shape. So pieces of that have been stitched all over the place, um, on boats, on buses, in people's living rooms. Um, and then we had various days where we would come back together. And, and obviously we had a lot of fun painting as well. Okay. So the last thing to say then is that um, in the spirit of this project, our Litfest has run a number of digital maps or poetry mosaics, maps in the spring, mosaics in the autumn for National Poetry Day. And we do a public call out inviting poets of the Northwest to submit work. 
And this year's theme, inspired by the River Tours River Loon project, was the rivers of the Northwest. And we had 60 plus submissions. And our poet in residence, Katie Hale, Cumbrian based poet, is going to MC a public reading of all those, um, uh, the 12 poems she wanted to bring to that reading on Saturday, the 25th of March, as the culmination of our poetry day at 7.30. So if you like the idea of that, please come back. And if you like the idea of Litfest, please donate on your way out. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs>